Hello, and welcome to episode number 64 of the Point of Convergence podcast. As always, I am your host, Exoacademian. When strange and sophisticated aerial vehicles were first spotted buzzing in and around our skies in a series of flaps during the period of the 1940s, many assumed these represented the visitation of an extraterrestrial species. The beyond next-gen characteristics of these advanced craft, where they could travel at incredible rates of speed, hover in place, and make 90-degree turns on a dime, suggested to most that these could not logically be the property of any known nation-state actor. The technological prowess of these so-called unidentified flying objects was simply too advanced to be of terrestrial origin. It is therefore not surprising that the seemingly logical conclusion that many came to was that these simply must be visitors from beyond our planet. At first, when the barrenness of the planets of our own solar system was not yet fully realized, many assumed these to be visiting Martians or Venusians. And then, as our surveying of the planets of our own solar neighborhood showed them to be lifeless, ufologists and the public alike began to wonder from which extrasolar source these beings were coming from. But again, the assumption was still that these must be visitors from outer space. After all, that seemed to be the only frontier we had yet to explore. Since those early days of the flying saucer phenomenon, other, and to most, more exotic hypotheses have arisen, suggesting these others may be interdimensional in nature, or perhaps even time-traveling humans from our future. Some researchers suggest both extraterrestrials and interdimensionals may be in the mix. In the course of that conversation, again, the assumption has been that these must be something non-terrestrial in nature, because the sophistication of the craft themselves suggests no known nation-state actor could have developed such beyond-next-gen technology. However, there is one key assumption being made here, and that is that it is only the known nation-state actors, the United States, Russia, etc., that could possibly even get close to this level of technological sophistication. The pertinent question to ask here is, is that a fair assumption to make? Is it only nation-state actors that we need to account for? Or is it possible that some other human group, not usually accounted for, could actually be responsible for the design and development of these UFOs, or at least some of them? Perhaps to many people's surprise, there is a rather daunting amount of historical evidence suggesting the possibility that these craft, or again, at least some of them, could actually be the property of a rogue group of scientifically oriented techno-military elites that may have broken off from conventional society sometime during the middle part of the 20th century, not long after, we should note, the first series of sightings of disc-like craft. But what is the nature of this evidence? And does it get even close to passing muster in terms of suggesting that a truly sequestered society might exist in our very midst? Is it possible that some of the beyond next-gen vehicles that have been spotted in our skies might actually be of terrestrial origin after all, even if that terrestrial origin is of a non-conventional nature, one that exists beyond the scope of our nation-state global system? These are the very questions we'll seek to engage with in this, the 64th episode of the Point of Convergence podcast. As we begin this week's podcast, I want to restate something I've said multiple times on this podcast, and that is that I believe it's most likely that the UFO phenomenon is a totality comprised of different actors from different origins. I think we should resist the temptation to collapse multiple actors and origins into one when the data doesn't strongly suggest we should do so. When we even unconsciously proceed with the working assumption that it's all one thing with one overarching agenda from one source, it can lead to some strange conclusions being drawn from what may actually be multiple, distinct, and divergent patterns of behavior within the totality of the phenomenon. Now, in what we're going to explore today, I think there are avenues with greater credibility and others with less credibility. Much of what we will discuss is speculative. That's a given with much of the UFO phenomenon. 
but today we will discuss speculative threads in terms of our own history. But one thing I will say is that while I am generally not a conspiracy theorist proponent, over time my faith in the mainstream conventional story that has been told to us in school and whatnot about our history has suffered some setbacks, you could say. We should remember that history is told through the viewpoint of the victors and of those who continue to hold power. And as such, we should always keep a skeptical eye on the spotlight being shone from the halls of power. Those of us deeply involved in this topic know that Project Blue Book and the like make it clear that the government has frequently lied to its people about highly important civilization-changing matters. It would be naive to think that's the only time they opted for such a course of revisionist history telling. I titled today's episode, The Sequestered Society, and this is based very much on something Richard Dolan first proposed in his notion of a breakaway civilization. You can actually purchase a short book based on a lecture that Dolan gave describing this. And this is the description of that lecture. Quote, Is there a secret space program that is connected in some way to UFOs? In this booklet, historian Richard Dolan delves into this question, one of the most discussed in ufology today. Providing a wealth of data and context for the reader, he offers his own conclusion. Yes, there is indeed such a program, but this program is not a simple extension of the normal operations of the U.S. government or military, much less of NASA. Instead, it seems to be the product of what Dolan has previously termed a breakaway civilization, a radically advanced and increasingly separate structure that has access to classified science and data denied to the rest of us, unquote. So that gives you a sense of what Dolan means by this notion of a breakaway civilization. It's a rogue group that may have begun within the governments of the world, the United States, Nazi Germany, the Soviet Union, etc., but at some point broke away and became a sequestered society functioning independently of any nation-state actor. Now, in a moment, we'll get into the history, the details of history, that suggest such a row group may exist. But before we get there, I want to touch on some of the data that suggests to me the likelihood that such a group might exist. And it has to do with the nature of the UFO craft that have been observed, or at least some of them, and even some of the remains that have been gathered from supposed UFO crashes. What I find peculiar when I think about some of the technology we see displayed with UFOs is that while it is sophisticated compared to our technology, it's not so beyond what we might get to within a generation or two. And that's just strange when you think about the idea that these would be extraterrestrial visitors. If we're talking about an extrasolar civilization that is visiting us, the likelihood that they would have technology within a few generations of ours is very, very, very low. I really can't stress that enough. When you think about the vast age of the cosmos, we may be interacting with civilizations that could be millions or billions of years older than us or anywhere in between. So when you think about how technology develops, and you think about the notion that even Lou Elizondo has suggested some of this technology is now understood theoretically, and that we probably could develop it on our own within about 50 years or less, that's very strange. Again, when you think about what are the chances that a ET civilization that just happens to visit us is within a few generation cycles of our own technology. I'm not saying all UFOs match that description, but some seem to, including some of the remains that have been gathered from supposed UFO crashes. That has always been suspect to me, has made me wonder, has made me ask questions. And when I came across this breakaway civilization hypothesis, I was surprised as I dug deeper how much evidence there is at least suggesting the possibility that such a rogue group does indeed exist. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Much of this ties back to the history of Nazi Germany, the Soviet Union, and the United States. And that's because we should remember that at the end of the Second World War, 
the United States and the Soviet Union both gathered former Nazi scientists, people who were at the cutting edge of their fields, and took them back into their own nations and then gave them control of their own programs. For instance, space programs, when they were still part of the military structure and NASA didn't yet exist. Now, a book that I would highly recommend you read if you're interested in this series of threads is a book called The Hunt for Zero Point by Nick Cook, who is an experienced aviation writer who knows that of which he speaks. This is the description of that book. Quote, The atomic bomb was not the only project to occupy government scientists during the 1940s. Anti-gravity technology, originally spearheaded by scientists in Nazi Germany, was another high priority, one that still may be in effect today. Now, for the first time, an acclaimed journalist with unprecedented access to key sources in the intelligence and military communities reveals suppressed evidence that tells the story of a quest for a discovery that could prove as powerful as the atomic bomb. The Hunt for Zero Point explores the scientific speculation that zero point energy, a limitless source of potential power that may hold the key to defying and thereby controlling gravity, exists in the universe and can be replicated. The pressure to be the first nation to harness gravity is immense, as it means having the ability to build military planes of unlimited speed and range, along with the most deadly weaponry the world has ever seen. The ideal shape for a gravity-defying vehicle happens to be a perfect disk, making anti-gravity tests a possible explanation for numerous UFO sightings during the past 50 years. Drawn from interviews with those involved in the research and visits to labs in Europe and the United States, The Hunt for Zero Point is a captivating account of the 20th century's most puzzling, unexplained phenomenon." Unquote. Now, while, as I mentioned at the outset, much of this information is somewhat speculative, some of it is very well documented. For instance, Operation Paperclip. Now, what was that? Operation Paperclip, according to Wikipedia, was a secret United States intelligence program in which more than 1,600, that's 1,600, Nazi German scientists, engineers, and technicians were taken from former Nazi Germany to the U.S. for government employment after the end of World War II in Europe between 1945 and 1959. Conducted by the Joint Intelligence Objectives Agency, it was largely carried out by special agents of the U.S. Army's Counterintelligence Corps, CIC. Many of these personnel were former members and some were former leaders of the Nazi Party. The primary purpose for Operation Paperclip was U.S. military advantage in the Soviet-American Cold War and the space race. In a comparable operation, the Soviet Union relocated more than 2,200 German specialists, a total of more than 6,000 people, including family members, with Operation Ozovakium during one night on October 22, 1946. Unquote. And this is a key point I want us to pay attention to here. These were not just low-level Nazi scientists who weren't really affiliated with the party and its pagan cult-like belief system. Some of these were very high-ranking members of the Nazi party, SS officers, suggesting they actually were true believers in the pagan cult-like belief system that underpinned Nazism. And again, we really want to highlight this point. And historian Peter Lavenda has made this argument in several of his books. These Nazi officers were true believers. What we mean by that is that they weren't just aligning from one political system and then switching to another when they were taken to the U.S. system. Rather, they were true believers in a pagan dogma. And like any cult-like system, that suggests they were not likely to quickly abandon that belief system. And Lavenda argues, to the contrary, that they actually remained true believers, that many of them never adopted American identities or Western identities. They were Nazis to the core, believing in the dogma set from start to finish. And understanding that historical context helps us understand how perhaps 
both ex-Nazis in the U.S. and other ex-Nazis in the Soviet Union were perhaps working behind the scenes, conspiratorially, to build a kind of deep state that was a sub-government underpinning other governments like the U.S. and the Soviet Union, suggesting perhaps that even the space race, or at least the commonly understood narrative about it, was to some degree a farce, that the public had one notion of it, and even political leaders had one notion of it, but actually much of it was controlled, according to this narrative anyway, by these ex-Nazis, both in the U.S. and the Soviet Union, who remained true believers of the pagan cult system of Nazism. Now, as I mentioned previously, it's important to remember that the rocket technology we were developing when we took these Nazis and put people like Vermeer von Braun in charge of our space program, this was still a military structure. NASA was only launched later on as a civilian organization, and many argued that that was really a change in name only, that the same people were still running it, and largely doing so behind the scenes and without much oversight. One of the arguments that several historians make is that it's surprising how little oversight these Nazis had within the U.S., for instance, considering they were actually former enemies. So in other words, if they wanted to be in collusion with another group of ex-Nazis in the Soviet Union, forming a kind of rogue government that was actually controlling the space program behind the scenes, it seems like historically that could be possible. They really were not given the oversight they should have been and that you would expect them to have been. And some historians, like Lavenda and Dolan and Jason Reza Giorgiani, suggest that it's during this period that the so-called secret space program was truly born. And in terms of the buildup of the military-industrial complex in general that began in the late 40s and went into the 1960s and beyond, we're reminded, of course, of the warning that President Dwight Eisenhower gave on his farewell address in 1961 when he said, quote, In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist, unquote. And this speaks to Eisenhower's sense that there was a vast structure, a growing structure, the military-industrial complex, as he called it, which was running amok that was building in power and influence almost exponentially and largely unchecked. And he warned the American people of this in his farewell address in 1961. And it's certainly worth noting that if even an American president is concerned about this and offering this as a warning at his farewell address, it certainly should raise eyebrows about the nature of the power structure of our government, especially in deeply embedded circles. Now, what might we look to in terms of evidence suggesting there was some sort of collusion between ex-Nazi scientists in both the Soviet Union and the American government that were actually running the space race behind the scenes and only putting forward a farce of a narrative for everyone else to digest? Well, what Lavenda, Peter Lavenda, points to is the fact that Sputnik was the first artificial Earth satellite put into orbit. And of course, that was by the Soviets. That was in October 1957. He argues, if we had the creme de la creme of the Nazi scientists running our rocket program, why was it that the Soviets managed to launch an artificial Earth satellite first? That seems suspect according to his understanding, and he thinks it suggests that there was a collusion going on, and that perhaps even the Nazi scientists running our rocket program and then later NASA, when it became a civilian organization, again, only in name, is that the Nazi scientists running it weren't even really trying. And perhaps no one else had the expertise to realize that perhaps they were just stalling and letting the Soviet side get ahead because that was part of their overarching plan. Now, earlier we talked about Nick Cook's excellent book, The Hunt for Zero Point which discussed the possibility that the Nazis were on the verge or perhaps had achieved a breakthrough in this technology, which again would not only shear space-time and create space-time distortion as a result, but would perhaps open a vortex allowing for the channeling of an unlimited source of energy. Now, the actual device we're speaking about here is called Die Glocke, 
which is German for the bell. This is often referred to as the Nazi bell because it was a bell-shaped device with counter-rotating drums. And the notion here was that it used electromagnetic stresses and subjected these to the serum within the bell, which made a change at a quantum level, opening a vortex as in a supermassive black hole, which then functioned, hypothetically anyway, like a power plant providing unlimited free energy. So again, the implication here is not only that you would have free energy, that once you've expended the energy to open the vortex, from then on you could pull free energy from the ether, so to speak, forever, but it also, as a byproduct, because the forces actually sheared space-time itself, allowed even for the possibility of time travel. And that's why this was titled by the Nazis, Project Kronos, named, of course, after the Greek god of time. Now, speaking of the possibility of time travel, some theorists, some researchers, such as Jason Reza Giorgiani, have suggested that perhaps these Nazis both within the U.S. government and the Soviet government, became aware of the likelihood or perhaps even the definite eventuality of catastrophic climate change on the earth. And this led these elites to prepare for life elsewhere. And some have suggested this may have been the planet Mars, but not Mars of today, but rather Mars of the distant past, when it was a vibrant, flourishing planet with a sustaining atmosphere, much like Earth. And of course, this fits in with the secret space program narrative, suggesting that actually some of these elites managed to achieve space travel to Mars as early as the 1960s. Now, in addition to the Nazi scientists that were recruited by both the United States and the Soviet Union at the close of World War II, we should remember that many Nazis escaped to South America and even to the Middle East, apparently. There is a fair amount of evidence that these Nazis managed to populate places such as Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, etc. And when you think about how far south Argentina is geographically, we also think of the fact that there are rumors again that there may even be secret Nazi bases in Antarctica. And of course, part of those rumors include the notion of flying saucers that are stored in secret subterranean bases there. Now, interestingly, in potential support of this notion, one can find evidence that Google Earth, for instance, blocks out certain high-definition views of parts of Antarctica. Again, this raises the question, why? Now, perhaps these are secret American bases or something like that. But nevertheless, it raises the question. Something seems to be there, justifying the blocking out of high-definition views. Now, speaking of the Nazis and the development of perhaps of flying saucers, we noted earlier that apparently the ideal shape for an advanced craft was determined to be a disc. And this has to do with something that's called the suction of the boundary layer. Basically, this refers to how resistance builds up around wings when planes are flying at high speeds. Now, originally slots were used to remove excess air. But the reason a disc is the perfect shape, the ideal shape, is that you can equally distribute the air resistance around the entire craft. And according to some of the rumors, the Nazi technology used disc-shaped craft and used slots at equal positions around the entire perimeter of the structure to remove excess air. Not only did this allow for maximum speed, because it took away the air resistance, but it also allowed for maximum maneuverability. And again, we think about these 90-degree turns that some of these craft have been observed making. So what we basically have here, apparently, hypothetically, is technology of flying saucers that combined this disk shape and the suctioning of the boundary layer, along with the technology that the Nazi bell, the Die Glock, produced via a shearing of space-time. Now, in terms of potential additional lines of evidence, we might look to Colonel Corso's book, The Day After Roswell, in which he discussed the materials that were found from the Roswell crash. Now, as rumor suggests, and as Corso suggests in his book, these materials were then farmed out to U.S. industry to allow the U.S. to develop, via reverse engineering, technological advancements that gave it a superiority over rival nations. Now, the technology gathered from the craft debris at Roswell apparently included things like 
Kevlar, night vision, lasers, perforated metal. Now that was certainly cutting edge technology for 1947, but not so cutting edge that it would seem to suggest that the origin source was of extraterrestrial nature. And what these various theorists are proposing is that actually what was recovered was debris from craft that were being tested by this breakaway civilization, by this secret, deeply embedded, sequestered society that at this point existed beyond the purview or control or perhaps even knowledge of any nation-state player. Furthermore, again, theorists such as Giorgiani suggest that even the cover stories for the Roswell crash point to the possibility that some segments of the U.S. government became aware that this was of terrestrial origin, but not of a nation-state actor, and that in addition to offering cover stories such as weather balloons, the alien UFO narrative was also a cover story to cover over the fact that a powerful non-nation-state player had the ability to fly into U.S. airspace and access a highly restricted nuclear facility because, again, at that point, Roswell was a key location of the U.S. nuclear arsenal. This is not something the U.S. government would have wanted to admit to its people. So the suggestion is, again, according to some theorists, that even the UFO ET explanation was actually a cover story to hide what was actually going on. Now, speaking of interaction between UFOs and nuclear facilities, we would be remiss to not also discuss the fact that this has happened historically many, many times. Robert Hastings, for instance, has documented this time and time again, where UFOs show up at sensitive nuclear facilities, and not only do they show up, but they're able to, at their will, shut down our nuclear warheads. And they've also done this in the Soviet Union. So some actor is apparently showing up and controlling, manipulating both the U.S. and the Soviet nuclear arsenal. Now, what if perhaps it is this rogue breakaway civilization and that counter to the common narrative that perhaps this is aliens from an extraterrestrial source trying to send us some coded message about the danger of our nuclear weapons, What if instead it is this non-nation state player, this breakaway civilization that has reached a level of technological sophistication far beyond conventional society and that actually what they are doing is a dry run to make sure they can control the entire nuclear capabilities of all nation state players? I think that's a counter explanation that we at least have to consider. And by the way, perhaps you're wondering if Nazi Germany had fallen at the point that the craft were observed, for instance, in 1947 by Kenneth Arnold near Mount Ray, near Washington, let us not forget that there still existed a fascist dictatorship in Europe. This was Francisco Franco's reign in Spain. And apparently, as rumor has it, they were actually developing disc-like technology. Flying saucers were being developed by Spain at this time, right around the same time that the first UFO sightings were spotted in the United States. That at least offers a possibility of a terrestrial origin for these flying saucers, which again would be an extension of the technology that had been developed by the Nazis during the war. And of course, let us not forget that Spain, of course, is Spanish-speaking, and so is Argentina and other places that these Nazis apparently escaped to. One final historical point of note that may relate to all of this is that of the strange airship sightings that happened in the late 19th and early 20th century, both in places like the American Southwest and places in South America. If you think back to some of those strange stories, sometimes these craft that looked next-gen at the time, but still terrestrial in nature, involved human beings landing asking for basic supplies like water and such, and even offering various farmers in Texas, for instance, rides to places like South America at what was considered then remarkable speeds. When asked about these craft and where they come from, it was suggested that Prussian nationalists were backing this technology that was being developed in places like Sonora, California, by a group that involved a kind of transatlantic 
cooperation between Germanic and American sources that had deep ancestral links to Prussian nationalism. In other words, both in America and in Germany, there was this common link of this deep Prussian background. And some very well-known Americans, like Rockefeller and Ford and Dulles, Alan Dulles, the first civilian director of the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, and the famous American investment banker J.P. Morgan, were highly involved in funding the early rise of Nazi Germany. Henry Ford has been known to be involved with anti-Semitic literature. Again, not only did their ancestral roots go back to Germany, but they were actually funding Prussian nationalists in Germany, and they themselves had Prussian nationalist backgrounds. Again, suggesting a transatlantic nexus that was perhaps planting the early seeds for this future breakaway civilization. Now, as we draw this episode to a conclusion, I would say that while it may seem a stretch to consider these various threads of what we might call alt-history as being legitimate, genuine, actually historical, it's worth noting that if the technology to harness zero-point energy and to therefore manipulate space-time was achieved at some point during the 20th century by some deeply black scientific techno-elites, the implications would be profound and incredibly far-reaching, allowing for not only the harnessing of limitless power, but also the creation of devices resembling the shape and capabilities of classical UFOs, while also making possible time travel and thus of history manipulation that at least could happen without the rest of the conventional nation-state civilization structure being any the wiser. Speculative? Yes, absolutely. Worth considering as yet another possible thread within the totality of the tapestry we call the UFO phenomenon? Absolutely. I believe we should answer that in the affirmative. And on that note, we've come to the close of another edition of the Point of Convergence podcast. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash exoacadamian. But until next time, friends, from deep within the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina, this is Exoacadamian, signing out.